Hello, 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 everyone. We're going to wait a couple minutes. Hopefully everything works out. Uh, everything works well right now on the camera and the sound. David, if you want to uh, to join, uh, just maybe let me know if sound and uh, and the uh, the camera everything works well. We're going to wait still a couple minutes before we get started. Sure. Pull it still up. Sound and uh, sound and camera still okay, David? Yeah. Beautiful. Nothing I can do about the haircut, but that's it is what it is. <laughs> I also see David, you have access to uh, the presentation right now. Everything is good on that front too. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, the mouse works. Perfect. Wait another couple minutes, guys, and we'll get started. I see that uh, lots of people are um, logging on as we speak, so I'll wait another 35 seconds or so, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Ready to rock and roll, David? Sure am. Sounds good. Let's do this. Hey guys, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or wherever you are located. Uh, I'm Andre Ryu with Acoustic Tech, and uh, we are David and I, David from Cyber Acoustics. We are super excited to uh, be with you today. Uh, obviously, we're together virtually, as it's the only option we've got. But uh, this is the third uh, webinar of our series. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about acoustics for mass timber. Very excited, and I'm particularly excited to have David with us, uh, with me this morning or this afternoon. Um, David from Cyber Acoustic has been uh, collaborating with Acoustic Tech for over 10 years. We've known each other for over 10 years. Um, David obviously uh, also worked on multiple mass timber projects uh, in different areas, specifically out east. Um, David has also, uh, over the years, uh, really um, made a point of, of, of growing his expertise in the field of mass timber. He's done a lot of cool things uh, over the past little while. And uh, for those of you that's ever seen our mass timber guideline, uh, David was uh, the person behind those tests, uh, comparative test and, and everything else, which by the way, side note that I'll say now, uh, we, are, we have a version two of that mass timber guideline, which includes um, surface density, um, elevation, and things like that. So super cool uh, that David could join me this morning. So uh, we're basically going to do this and do this as a team. We're obviously going to have some parts I'll take care of. David will take care of other parts. It's going to be super generous in content. Uh, David spent countless hours on putting some, uh, some stuff for you guys uh, together. That's not necessarily only on the IIC. Uh, which what you've come to know uh, from Acoustic Tech. Uh, so David, very excited once again. Thank you so much for participating with me on this uh, on this uh, webinar. Well, thank you for um, having me. For you guys' information, over 160 people signed up for this webinar. So uh, thank you so much. Truly appreciate you spending the next hour with us. We know that you guys are busy. There's lots going on, I'm sure. Uh, wherever you're located, whether it's home office or, or at the office. Uh, so again, we appreciate the fact that you're joining uh, joining us. Also, there's going to be uh, the recording uh, available. So if some of you have to leave a little bit earlier uh, for any reason. You'll have access to the recording uh, as uh, you know fully. And uh, for those of you to some extent have signed up, uh, which I'm assuming I'm talking to people that are not there. <laughs> so for those of you that signed up, uh, to some extent, that's also going to be available. Uh, one quick household uh, thing, uh, please put your phones on silent. Um, 
kidding. We can't uh, tell if your phone rings, but uh, we're giving, David and I are giving you an opportunity to, uh, to take a break from emails and Instagram and anything else uh, if you choose to do so. So hopefully it's gonna be uh, interesting for you guys. Uh, we got lots to cover and then we're going to get started. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, introduction, very briefly, the idea is not to spend a half hour on who we are. Uh, we wanna make sure we share as much as we possibly can. We're gonna talk about code requirements, uh, expectations, what we've seen over the past 20 years. Acoustic Tech's been in the acoustics field since 2000. Uh, and uh, obviously we've seen and heard a lot. Um, we're gonna talk about acoustic principles. I really wanna breeze through that. Some of you are at your first, second or third webinar. Those of you that uh, repeat, uh, I don't wanna take too long on the principles. And we're gonna spend a lot of time, David will spend a lot of time on the challenges. Uh, we also want to introduce you to some assemblies, uh, experiences, things we've seen, things we offer uh, that technically could be a solution for your upcoming or ongoing project. And uh, we're gonna wrap it up uh, within the hour. Uh, questions or anything like that, uh, between a, because of the platform, we'll keep it for after the fact. So if any of you have questions, uh, please take a note throughout the presentation and reach out to us after. We'll make sure every single question is actually um, answered. One quick note before we get started, lots, which is amazing, lots of acoustic engineers are attending uh, this webinar this, uh, this afternoon, this morning. Uh, this is not meant to be crazy technical. This isn't meant to replace uh, any kind of uh, sitting down consultation. Uh, what Acoustic Jack and Saib uh, together is trying to do is, is to keep things simple. We're trying to keep things casual. We're trying to basically, um, to some extent, not to go too much into details because it's very, very, uh, very easy to get lost into the details. This isn't what we're trying to do within the hour. Uh, we're just gonna try to breeze through this and then to some extent throw some ideas your way and then, uh, and then hopefully, uh, you know, finding some opportunities to collaborate together. Uh, David, anything you want to uh, add uh, to this? No, not at all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Beautiful. If you want to jump in, bud, please uh, jump in at any time. Thanks. So, who's Acoustic Tech? Very quickly, Acoustic Tech, uh, we've been doing Acoustic for 20 years, as I said. We've worked on uh, well over 25 million square feet of multifamily. We're located in eastern, um, eastern Canada. We obviously are able to handle anything in, uh, in North America, uh, for sure. What we specialize in, in the nutshell, is guidance and solutions for people that are frustrated with. Throughout those 20 years, we've come across so many people that were frustrated uh, with acoustics in different ways, uh, either acoustic complaints and or lawsuits, or the possibility of having an acoustic complaints or lawsuits. There's been a lot of uh, designs that were done a certain way. And after the fact, they're running into some issues. Property management companies and condo boards, which we deal with a lot, are also dealing with uh, the problems after the fact. So if you're a builder, you're an architect, GC, uh, engineer, uh, contractor, whomever you are, if ever you're frustrated with the possibility of having complaints or you're currently running into some complaints, uh, we can certainly help in identifying where the problem comes from and then ultimately find some solution and offer some options. Also, customer's negative perception of a building. This applies greatly to mass timber buildings. Uh, ultimately, we, uh, we know that wood frame buildings often have a negative, um, should I say, reputation versus concrete uh, buildings. Uh, it shouldn't be. The reason it is is because sometimes we're not necessarily uh, looking in the fine prints on how a wood frame building will perform, what should we be doing, what kind of solution we should apply, and then ultimately we end up in trouble. So in our experience, uh, we've run through this a lot. We are super close to the Woodworks group. I salute them. Some of you, some of these guys are actually attending this morning. So um, at the end of the day, there's no reason wood frame buildings should acoustically have a worse reputation than any other kind of structure. That includes mass timber. So that's one of the things that we try to help builders uh, you know, assess at the design stage. New code regulations, depending on if you're in the U.S. or in Canada, even within Canada, even within the U.S., New York City is a little bit different than other areas in the U.S., uh, for example, British Columbia and Canada are a little bit different in other areas within the country. So there's also new regulations on acoustics and weight. 
So we want to make sure that we're on top of that, that we're not neglecting anything. Last but not least, a ton of information and products out there and too often misguided information. Too many people in the acoustics field are interested solely or at least mainly into selling products. And, and sometimes a lot of corners are being cut and, uh, and then it leads to frustration, it leads to complaints. So ultimately trying to shed light on how acoustic uh, actually works and, and what we should be looking at should be key. In order to help us do all of this, uh, not only do we collaborate with David, with Saib, I'm also super proud to say we have great synergy with a lot of acoustic engineers in different territories. This obviously does not come in competition whatsoever. We're trying to sit at a table with the builder and architects, give them the right set of information, understand what people are trying to do, and then we're capable of doing that by offering different products, combining different assemblies, combining different technologies, and, and, and relying on the vast, um, you know, I guess, set of data and information and expertise we've, uh, we've got to, uh, to grow over the, past, uh, over the past 20 years. So um, as an example, we're also involved with Suprema, which is a large company in the building envelope business. So we have access to lots of their system and also to their technical department. Same thing with Firmacell, which is a James Hardy division. So proud to be able to handle the Firmacell systems and then, uh, and then ultimately our own acoustic tech systems too. So as you can see, under one umbrella, under one company, we become a little bit of a one, uh, you know, eight birds, one stone kind of gig, one stop shop, and it makes, uh, it makes a little bit of a turnkey operational but simple uh, or simpler, should I say, to the people that we work with. So we'll talk about the services a little bit more towards the end. This is not necessarily what I want to spend the most time on. Just so you know, you guys are not guinea pigs by any means. Uh, Acoustic we've worked on well over 15 mass number projects, uh, some of them in, in the East, some of them in the US, some of them in Western Canada and Ontario. Super proud of that. Uh, as far as we are concerned, so far so good. I haven't heard, knock on wood, any complaints whatsoever of anything that we've worked on. And it goes without saying that we're working on uh, multiple others as we speak in all territories. So uh, for those of you involved on that, listening in, thank you very much for uh, trusting us and, and uh, basically collaborating with us. If, uh, uh, if I may add something, Andre, excuse me. About absolutely. Uh, in a lot of these projects, I think it's important to mention that we've been uh, participating and working with uh, local acoustical consultants. So in some of them, we were, you know, in charge of the whole process of consulting, but in some of them also were participating in, uh, let's say, product recommendations or review of uh, details and assemblies. Uh, Absolutely. And that's a great point, David. It's, and once again, I want to reiterate that for the acoustic engineers in the room. We're, we're all on the same team. So ultimately, we've been doing that in Vancouver. We've been doing that in New York. We've been doing that in Chicago. We've been doing that in, in Montreal. So it goes without saying that uh, anything technically we work on, uh, we're, we're always excited when there's acoustic engineers involved. It just makes the whole process even better. And there's a lot of added value to that. But thanks for pointing that out, David. Um, so let's set the table quick. Why are we talking about acoustics? Why is there so many people signed up for this? Well, mass timber buildings offer great advantages. Uh, speed of construction is one of them, aesthetic. So there's a ton of advantages like a renewable uh, material. So I'm a huge fan, Acoustic is a huge fan of wood frame buildings, uh, obviously. Ultimately, uh, we also need to know that great results can be achieved when we pay attention to details. Unfortunately, in our experience, um, acoustic has always, or at least to some extent, acoustic has often been neglected, especially on the IIC, because the SEC is in the code, we'll talk about that in a minute, which creates frustration. So you'd be amazed how many people reach out to us in the last, um, actually, year or two, where ultimately they know that when you're working on mass number building, which is an amazing idea, that ultimately you cannot neglect acoustics. It's one with fire, certainly top three or top two of the issues that we need to assess. And that's kind of why we're basically uh, spending a great deal of time talking about this this morning. Very briefly on the code, um, STC, uh, obviously as you guys know in Canada, a little bit different than the US, but bottom line is the minimum STC required in Canada is 50, minimum ASTC requires 47. The recommended minimum is um, recommended minimum is 55. In the U.S., it's STC requires 50. 
ASTC is 45. So uh, we'll talk uh, in a second what the difference between the ASTC and STC, but ultimately one of them is somewhat of a real life field test. The other one is more of a lab test. So the building codes rec like recognizes both. Uh, but um, you'll see that as far as the STC is concerned, which is uh, anything from talking, music, radio, so anything not in contact structurally uh, or physically with the structure is considered an STC. It's usually not neglected because it's in the code, so you have no choice to do a certain, uh, a certain, uh, achieve a certain performance. Where the kicker uh, happens is when we're talking about IIC. IIC impact installation class is basically anything in contact with the structure, and typically it's usually from top to bottom. So footfall, moving objects, uh, dropping objects, anything basically creating some kind of vibration on the floor is going to be considered an impact sample. So ultimately, when you look at the requirement for the code, you'll notice that in Canada, it's not applicable. So the code does not require anything on IIC. The recommendation for IIC is 55. In the US, I would say probably a little bit better in that way because the US does recognize the, the IIC as a whole, and it should be 50 when you're talking to the US. It doesn't change the fact that in our experience, 80 plus percent of any complaint we come across, because we deal with the retrofit side of things too, come from the IIC. So I guess what we're saying is we got to be extremely cautious with what we're doing on the IIC, specifically with mass timber buildings, um, because at the end of the day, Mr. and Mrs. Smith that rent a unit, buy a unit, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's a BC housing, I, whether it's Greater Victoria housing, it, it, at the end of the day, whoever lives there has a set of expectations and they don't know what the code asks for. So our experience has dictated or has told us that the IIC probably shouldn't be neglected, even though it is not required in the code to some extent. One quick thing I want to say too about this is we're going to talk about the principles in a second. But I want you to notice that when it, an acoustic test is done on the IIC, there's a tapping machine that's basically uh, installed over top of the hardwood, laminate, ceramic tile, LVT, whichever it is. And it's a receiving machine in the unit below. One of the biggest mistakes we see in our industry, in our field, is the fact that at the end of the day, what we're not testing is a product. So if you come across someone that tells you that they're on delay, their drywall, their slab, whatever it is, is associated to a rating, it should be a red flag right there. You should know what that product was tested, what was on top, what was underneath, in what situation, what context, and what assembly it was actually tested in. Because that's the only way to achieve a rating is with an assembly, it's not with a product. And we're speaking from experience here, there's a lot of misguided information out there because people sometimes don't necessarily ask, oh, what was your floor? What was your slab? What was your CLT? What was your whatever tested with? And then uh, I can assure you there's a lot of surprises after the fact that are a lot harder to fix than if we would see this coming at the beginning. So enough said about uh, how it actually works. Very briefly, why is there STC IIC versus ASTC AIIC? Uh, the A stands for apparent. So basically, in a nutshell, what that means is in a lab, you're usually going to be in a perfect environment. You're not going to be dealing with flanking. You're not going to have, you're going to have a perfect assembly. There's usually not going to be as much uh, flanking paths that are going to create more vibration than you would actually want to. So a lab test, for comparison reasons, sure. But when at the end of the day, you're dealing with real life environment, that's what you're after. We need to take into consideration flanking. And that's actually one of the things that, uh, that David's going to spend the most time on. Principles. Uh, very quickly on that, different tones and timbers for sound, bass sound, low sound. Just keep in mind that low frequencies, bass sounds are harder to control. So not only when we're working on a building, we need to pay attention to FTC and IIC, but we also need to pay attention to the high frequency and low frequency because different materials and different structure by nature will perform more on one versus another because of density, because of different things. So just keep that, uh, we got to keep that in mind to some extent. Acoustic principles, again, I'm going to breeze through this. 
Uh, the importance of mass, resilience, and decoupling, void treatment, sealing, and flanking. I'll put this in perspective with mass timber structures. Mass, heavier a material is, better it's going to do on STC. So voices, television, radio will be reduced, will be stopped, will be absorbed, uh, obviously more if it's a dense structure. So ultimately, why are concrete structures very efficient on STC out of the gate? is simply because a six, eight, or 10 inch slab made of concrete super dense. So on the STC, it performs very well. If you're working with a same thickness made of wood, by, by definition, the wood's gonna be not as dense as concrete. So ultimately, we need to make sure we compensate for that lack of mass. The second thing that mass will do is flanking. Heavier a building is, less it's gonna tend to vibrate. So ultimately, if we add more weight, that's, by the way, one of the main reasons why we add usually a concrete topping to a light wood frame building, mid-rise building, is because it, you want the building to be a little bit heavier. So when you walk on it, the, the floor is not actually bending and vibrating as much. Okay, so that's mass. Resilience and decoupling, by far, the most neglected in our field, which basically means things not touching each other. So the difference between IIC and STC is IIC need a physical path to travel. So if you give them the opportunity of creating different hard materials over top of each other, that vibration is going to go right through everything that's attached. I want you to imagine to illustrate this, if all of a sudden you would levitate a floor covering, it doesn't matter what the rest of the structure looks like. If the floor covering is not touching the rest of the structure, it has nowhere to go. So the vibration, the IIC is going to die right there. So if we're wondering why carpet is more efficient than hard surface flooring, it's because of the principles of uh, principle of resilience and decoupling. That's also something David's going to touch on. Void treatment, uh, the presence of bad insulation. Once again, in mass timber, if we have an exposed ceiling, we're in a position where there's there may not be a ceiling at all. There may not be the opportunity to basically, uh, you know, treat the void. So once again, we got to compensate. We got to be aware of that in order to uh, to end up where we want to end up. Ceiling, wherever air can pass, so can sound. I'm sure you've all experienced hotel rooms that have uh, vents or whatnot that are not sealed properly, or a gap under the door. It's irrelevant how good your door is. If there's an inch of air underneath the door, sound's going to find that and it's going to make it to the hallway or into the unit. Blanking. I'm not going to go long on this because David's going to touch on that. Flanking, very much related to resilience and decoupling also. All about things not touching each other. So less things are touching each other, better off we're going to be acoustically. Um, example, uh, thermal and electricity works the same way. To some extent, just to illustrate that. So if I look at a naked wire uh, you know, on the wall because somebody like took the plug off, it, if I'm not touching it, I'm not going to be in trouble. It's if I ground it that I'm going to be in trouble. Same thing with thermal. I can look at a fire all I want. But if I grab my hand and put it in the fire physically, then ultimately I'm going to burn my hand. So acoustics on the IIC works the exact same way. And it's obviously not the same with the STC, which does not require physical contact. David, you want to take over on the challenges? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Andre. So uh, thank you very much everyone for attending. Uh, we're slowly but surely uh, becoming, becoming adepts at, at using uh, these kind of techno technological tools. So uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, we're not gonna go too deep into the subject, just like Andre said, we wanna keep it casual. We only have one hour. That being said, uh, I wanted to share a few challenges, uh, but you can also see it as a few tips, maybe, uh, or a new way to see things, or you know, just to to promote being creative in uh, this kind of uh, construction system. So, um, into the challenges, we're going to cover the vibrations, uh, the lining, uh, flanking, junctions, and connections. You're going to see that. A lot of these, uh, these things have been discussed by Andre with the gifts uh, previously. That being said, uh, I'm, you know, we're going, still going to cover them a bit uh, more into depth. So to start with, uh, we're going to talk about vibrations. Uh, in, the, in the building, you have two types of vibrations. You have the audible vibrations, which are within the range of the human uh, you know, uh, 
perception. So it's in between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Uh, 20 hertz being very low and 20 kilohertz, be, be, you know, being very high, so a, a high pitch. Uh, and the vibrations can be felt. Uh, what I mean felt is you can feel them in your feet. So, uh, you know, even if there's, you know, uh, I, I, how can I say that? You know, you can cut the line between audible and, and you know, physically felt vibrations. You have to take into account that something that you, you can feel in your feet so let's say i have uh, a vibration in my structure or in my floor that is uh, 50 hertz um or let's say 10 hertz so you can't you cannot hear it uh with your ears that being said what it's going to do is it's going to make something else vibrate so let's say you have glasswares in into a cabinet or something like that so the vibration is going to make these kind of you know items move it's gonna make them vibrate. And this is in fact, something that is indirectly audible. So keep that in mind. And for example, uh, you know, earthquakes, uh, the, the common earthquakes are, uh, you know, in between 0 0.01 Hertz and 10 Hertz. So even if you cannot hear them, uh, you can feel them in your legs, but you can also uh, see what they have. These kind of vibrations have an impact on. So um, just as I said, uh, let's say that you have a CLT panel, whatever the kind of panel, you know, it's, it's not only applicable for CLT, it's, it's, it's also true for every kind of structures. So let's say that you create an impact on it. So I put there a, a hammer, it can be your, your you know, a shoe, your feet, whatever. Uh, you're gonna see that there's a vibration going through the structure. And just like I said, if you have a cabinet, just on the other side of a wall, even if you have the best wall possible, you're gonna make it vibrate. If you have, you know, glass wares in it, it's gonna vibrate and you're gonna be able to, to, uh, to hear the, 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 the low frequencies vibration. So you, you won't hear them, but indirectly you'll be able to, to, to hear them. So, um, yeah, so uh, what can you do so to reduce uh, induced vibration? So you can use damping. So you can do you can use isolators. You can you can use absorbers. So you can uh, mitigate the energy going through the slab to the cabinet. So let's say that right now the problem is we have too much noise coming from the cabinet. You have two ways to treat your problem. The first one would be to you know just put a pillow or put a you know an isolator in between the impact and the structure in which the vibration is going through, or you can correct where the vibration goes out and affect your vibrating uh, you know, piece of equipment or you know, glasswares or cabinet, whatever. So I think it's a very important to mention here that it's always a lot easier to treat uh, at the source. So, you know, in the building, and there's a lot of consultants here right now, probably, you know, 90% uh, of the problem can be solved at the source, and you only have, you know, let's say 10% at, at the reception of, of the problem. You know, vibrations have a lot of energy. The frequencies, you know, tend to be to, to to travel very far. So you have to take into account that the most efficient way to uh, correct a problem is to to correct it at its source. Okay. Um, what else can you do? So you can increase tension, stiffness into your structure. So if your structure, let's say, is very sensitive in lower frequencies, what you want to do or what you may want to do is to increase its, you know, resonating frequency. So by doing that, you're going to uh, less feel the vibrations in your, uh, in your legs. So it's going to have a, you know, a lesser impact on everything that you're going to move. But uh, keep in mind that the higher you're going to make, you know, a structure or, or a flooring or something that vibrate, the easier normally it is to, to soundproof also. So you're working on due to kind of uh, problems uh, here. Uh, one other option would be to increase inertia. So Andre talked about mass. So I just, you know, copy wrote, uh, copy pasted a small uh, summary of, uh, you know, a small definition. So it's a resistance, it's the resistance of a decoupled topping to a change in velocity. So if you were to give, uh, you know, an impact of a hammer onto something that is quite heavy, that is decoupled from your uh, structure, you're going to have to fight against its inertia. And uh, this is something that you may want to evaluate and may want to do into your building. So we're talking about floating concrete toppings. 
uh, also, well, using concrete in uh, these kind of structures or any kind of denser material um, can create a better acoustical barrier. So it's very important to, to consider it. Uh, so what else can you do? Also, uh, you can create discontinuities. Uh, that being said, be cautious when building the layout. I wrote that because let's say that you have two different scenarios. Here, here on the first one, at the top one, you have a span that covers uh, uh, you know, uh, three, uh, three posts, three columns. If you don't have a discontinuity here, you're going to increase the flanking coming from the left to the right side of your panel. Okay. That being said, your vertical deflection in between, you know, two columns is going to be lower than if you create a discontinuity. So let's say that if you have two units only concentrated on this side and you have a demising wall in between them, that would be a bad, bad idea. That would be a bad choice because everything that happens on one side is gonna have like, you know, it's gonna um, affect what happens on the other side also. So you're gonna increase the kind of the, how the waves are gonna travel into your system. Uh, that being said, if you were to create a unit only on the left part between the two columns and on the, on the right part, you're gonna create a separate unit. So this is maybe uh, one of the ways to, um, to just uh, mitigate the flanking or the vibrations coming coming from one side to the other side. So you have to take into account your fire, you know, your fire protection, your fire resistance. You know, I don't want also, once again, I don't want to go into the detail, details. I just want to speak about acoustics. So this is one way to, uh, to reduce vibrations from one unit to the other, okay? Uh, there's also the type of context. So it's not covered that much. Uh, I think uh, personally, I haven't seen that much of information, you know, more into uh, mechanical engineering. So how gears just, you know, grind into each other to make a piece move. Uh, uh, it's also uh, very interesting to consider the types of contact into uh, the, the acoustical solutions that are going to be used into a building. So there are two points, two types of contact. There's a conformal contact. So this is you know, the most common contact. So let's say you have a flooring installed over a membrane. It's a full surface uh, installation. Uh, the contact is uniform. Uh, it's gonna be a conformal contact, okay? If you have, uh, let's say, uh, the tip of a sphere in contact with a substrate, this is gonna create only a small point, you know, a small pinpoint on which the contact between what's, what happens over the sphere and under it uh, well, the contact is going to be very small. So this is what we see non-conformal contact. So a small line in between a connection between two cylinders, uh, or, or, or maybe, uh, you know, only a point, just like, as I said, the point of a sphere. Okay. Uh, in fact, Acoustitech developed a product. It's called a Sophix. It use exactly this, this type of physics. So, uh, it works with half spheres. So the only point of contact with the product and the structure is, the point of a sphere. So we're dealing into non-conformal uh, acoustical solutions. I think it's very interesting. There's not a lot of research on that, but I think we're gonna see more and more uh, uh, coming on the market. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the lining. So uh, what's a lining? So it's something that is used to line another thing. So a layer of material or the inner side of a surface or something. Normally, when you're talking about lining, so it's the inside part of, let's say, your uh, your your blouser or whatever your kind of clothing that you want to you want to wear. Uh, in clothing, it adds you know breath uh, breathability. It adds insulation, comfort, aesthetics. Um, it's uh, you know it's uh, it's one part of you know it's it's one part of doing very you know higher end uh, clothing. And you know, interestingly, it's very similar if you were to use it on mass timber products. There are lots of, you know, different kinds of mass, mass timber products. Uh, here, I only show the part of them. So NLT, GLT, CLT, LDL, you have columns, you have uh, beams, uh, you know, you have DLT, you have just trended products, you have, uh, you know, uh, beam boxes system. Uh, they all have their, you know, little tricks to take into account. And one of them is to avoid air leaks. Um, these kind of products, you know, the, the wood being porous, uh, it, it, you know, it's easier for the air to go through these kind of systems. So you have to take that into account and you cannot, you know, you cannot hide from it. So if you want to avoid air leaks, 
dealing with uh, aligning over or under your structure may be something that is uh, to consider very much. Uh, it also works like a, you know thermal insulation. Um, so it's a two, uh, you know, it's a one stone two birds, right? Uh, what the lining can do also, um, it protects from rain rainstorms. So some some of them, some of, of the linings that uh, can be used can be only installed on the field, but some of them can be installed at the manufacturing at the facility itself by the manufacturer of the of the mass timbers, you know, elements. This is very interesting because if you were to apply something that let's say is waterproofing or adds also an added value for the acoustics on site, uh, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna fear uh, any, you know, any uh, rainstorms happening while, while you deliver your, your system or you don't want any kind of mud in your system. So uh, I think it's a very, you know, it's, it's a perk that is uh, to consider. Um, increase the acoustical performance. You know, I love I love the irony be behind this uh, drawing. We see it a lot on the internet. It says that hey, the thicker the material or, or the heavier it is. Here we have one meter of gabion, so it's you know all rocks stacked together in, in, into a kind of cage made of metal. Um, here we have solid blocks. You have bricks and you know others. A chain is as good as its weakest link. So even if you had uh, one meter of gabion, which is very heavy, you know, the gabion itself has so, you know, there's so many air leaks in between the rocks. I don't know why this has been used, you know, in, uh, in this, uh, in this um, uh, image, in this picture. That being said, keep in mind that the heavier it is, the better. That being said, you know, leaking has a major neg negative impact on your overall performance. So you may want to consider using something that even if it's thin, even if it's lightweight, it's gonna, it's still gonna seal your leaks. So you have to take the leaks into account. Uh, so you may want to consider something, even if it's, you know, easy to install or lightweight or whatever, even if it, it's, it does not create the best acoustical barrier possible, you, you may want to install it in your product to avoid leaking, okay? Uh, common lining, so drywall, everyone knows that. Uh, it can be installed, you know, mainly it's, it's installed on the underside, uh, you know, in European uh, countries, uh, it's also installed on the top side of the systems. So it's all depending on the way that, the, you know, the, the, the load is, uh, is applied. And concrete is, you know, normally used on top of the systems. Uh, in my last projects, I've used membranes. Uh, it happened to be a uh, very interesting solutions. Keep in mind that the products have to breathe. You know, the wood is something that is living. So you have to take into account that it needs to breathe, it needs to dry, it needs to contract and move. So take, into, take that into account when you're selecting your lining. There are others that have been, that, that have been sorry about that, that has been tested a parge, plaster, et cetera. So only a, only a tip to, to, to consider. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about the flanking. So for these remaining parts, most of the time I use, uh, I, I just 3D draw uh, models of, uh, you know, section of walls and connections and, thin, and things like that. I just wanna discuss them. I'm not gonna shoot any kind of STC or IIC value. I think that that's not the point and it's so, so much, um, how can I say that? It's um, at the end of the day, if you don't have any, you know, control or, on the quality of workmanship uh, of workmanship on site, it's uh, it's something sad, but it's going to affect the uh, the projected results. Okay, so uh, all right. So as a reminder. Andre, I think you may want to, uh, to stop moving your mouse, please. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, what is flanking? Well, flanking, as Andre said previously, it's uh, all the indirect paths that the energy can take to go from one room to another. You know, maybe the left room to the right room, maybe from the seven, you know, the seventh story to the eight. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's only, you know, it's all the different kind of paths that the energy can get through to get from one point to another. 
and it's you know very important knowing that if you have a demising wall you do, you want to minimize the kind of energy that goes from one place to another and doesn't affect the comfort of your neighbor right uh so as you can see here you have you may have energy going through a duct so ventilation ducts uh you may have energy going through the partition itself so normally in acoustics this is you know what we mainly analyze so you know assembly wall assemblies but we have you know to take into account the flanking so and you sorry about that flanking and vibrations so uh everything that goes through the ceiling everything that goes through the slab or the the, the, the mass timber panel so there's not much of a difference between flanking and the vibrations. In fact, vibrations are one of the many indirect paths. Here I just, you know, copy and pasted a cartoon. So it's someone jiggling his head, his leg and, you know, his uh, desk neighbor is being irritated by it. Uh, it's exactly what happens in real life. So you may want to take that into account. A few tips now. So let's say they have a hammer, you're creating a wave or you know a vibration into your floor, it's gonna make the, the wall vibrate. So this is one of the way to to you know to hear the kind of vibrations that can go through a system. Uh, what you may want to do now is uh, to install something, a kind of decoupling, decoupling material. It can be a polymer. There are lots of kind of you know products to do that right now on the market. Uh, by doing that, what you're going to do is you're going to minimize the quantity of energy going from the slab to the wall, okay? That being said, once again, a chain is as good as its weakest link. If installing this kind of material creates air leaks or whatever, you may want to, you know, choose another option. So sometimes people say, hey, I'm going to use that to create decoupling or, you know, for this reason, that reason. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. So sometimes it's a waste of investment. And sometimes, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it doesn't have its place. So it, it, you may even lose performance by choosing the wrong products. Okay. So take that into account. Um, let's say that you have a demising wall. It's, uh, it's made of metal studs. You have a concrete topping. So all in all, you know, you, you, you follow every kind of uh, tips that you've heard uh, regarding acoustics. So you, you've installed mast on top of your uh, mast timber panel. In fact, yes. So if you were to hit the top of your concrete topping with a hammer, you're going to minimize the quantity of energy going you know, into the slab because you have a resiliency. You have something that creates a spring between your topping and your slab. That being said, most of the energy is going to get through uh, by, by the concrete, simply like that. So what you may want to do is to create a break in between, okay? It also can be achieved with, uh, you know, lightweight solutions, uh, be it the sophics, be it thermosol products. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of acoustical products on the market. So uh, this one, as I said before, it works with half sphere. So it's non-conformal contact with the structure. By doing that, you minimize the quantity of energy going through the structure and at the end going through your wall, okay? Uh, when you're using these kind of products, you may want to consider the fire resistance. So the way the walls are installed on top or under these kind of materials is very important because right here, right now, you have a fire continuity going from one side to the other because if you, well, you may don't see it, but it's, it's fly with layers on top of it, okay? So what you may want to do is to install your wall, you know, more of a, an unorthodox way uh, just to fit them directly on your system and make sure that you have your fire resistance. So you may want it or not, but fire protection is, you know, very intricate, uh, connected to the, uh, the acoustical uh, performance of your assembly. Uh, it's important to build the right wall, so choose the right type of studs, the spacing, the, the gated steel, the depth of your wall, the insulation used, the decoupling, the type and quantity of drywall, and assess the wall penetration. So you may have the best wall possible if you don't know how to treat your penetrations, it's gonna behave uh, poorly. You're gonna, you're gonna lose some investment, okay? Um, you know, resilient channels are very good unless you're shortcutting the system with a screw. It's not very, you know, feasible here. You may want to consider using materials that are more efficient in isolating or, um, you know, reducing vibrations. Most of them are, you know, 
better because it's a kind of it's a kind of stupid proof uh, material. So uh, some of them are only good because you cannot possibly create a shortcut between the drywall and the the, the frame of your building. So consider every kind of uh, solutions. A hat channel is not a resilient channel. I hear that a lot. So just take take care of that. Uh, the coupling is very important. So make sure that your flooring doesn't touch, you know, the slab doesn't touch the wall, neither the baseboard, the quarter runs. Uh, everything is connected. So if if it is, well, vibration is going to get through uh, through all this. Uh, we're going to talk about about the junction. I'm going to go faster because one hour is quite short. Uh, every detail, every detail is important. Here we have a demising wall in connection uh, with. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, a, a, a mass timber panel. You may want to have uh, acoustical caulking. Uh, you know, decoupling between the the slab and your uh, and your uh, wall. The right type of steel, the right type of insulation, the right type of uh, drywall. So you may also want, let's say, that you have a lot of leaks, a lot of flanking problems to create a ball head. Let's say that let's say that you add instead of an OG here, you you create a ball head. That gives you know more space for the uh, the leaks to uh, to to get lost into. Um, oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna just go on the previous here. Uh, once again, the chain is as good as its uh, weakest link. So even if you were to build the best wall possible, if you have um, a, a, you know a beam right over it and you're trying to do the best kind of connection, you know these kind of mass timber beams are not acoustically efficient. So you may want to work it another way or see the problem, you know, in another angle. So a few tips, uh, you, you may want to create a kind of box, you know, to encapsulate the one side of your uh, CLT beam. You may want to insulate both sides of, uh, of your beams. And, you know, uh, sometimes you don't have that much, you know, time or money to do something that is very, very efficient. So there are kind of tips like that. So you're going to sacrifice one apparent side of the beams, expose one another. So right now, let's say that if you have energy going through there, it's going to need to go through the first part of the wall. So you're going to maximize your, uh, your assembly performance. Uh, once again, it can be pimped up a bit. So um, yeah, so you can uh, encapsulate both sides, but you know, just just move it on the side of the of the beam. Uh, now the connections, there are a lot of connection. Keep in mind that mass timber has been used by humans, uh, you know, for thousands of years. Uh, you have screws, brackets, blocks, bearing angles, plates, uh, angle brackets. You know, some of them are concealed, some of them are apparent. Um, some of are made for tensional stress, compressional stress, shear stress. You know, uh, an angle bracket can be used for tensional stress, but another one for shear stress. So um, there are a lot of components. It's very hard because it's not that much documented. documented. Uh, but what you may want to do uh, is ask for vibration reduction index whenever possible. So more and more manufacturers of these type of connections are uh, testing them, you know, on a laboratory or, you know, factory or backdoor, whatever kind of assembly. And uh, they can measure how much vibration is being reduced uh, from one side of the assembly to the other by going through the uh, different kind of connections. So this is, uh, you know, new data and it's always very fun or interesting to uh to analyze uh, once again non-continuity is better for acoustics so make sure that if you can just break down the continuities of panels i know that it has an impact on your diaphragm or mechanical strength i'm only speaking about acoustics now uh damping is better okay avoid air pathways so ceiling is very important so andre uh please uh i'm sorry i take maybe a, a few uh, <laughs> too much minutes but uh, it's your uh, it's your turn now so is this so is it my time to play with the mouse and take control now, uh, David? It is, yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually looking at a question panel to see if there's anything I could actually answer on the spot, and I forgot that I have control over the thing. So I apologize. 
Um, well done. I've learned actually a lot of things. Uh, ironically, we've been playing in this for a long time. So David, super helpful. I'm sure that uh, everyone will agree that there's a lot of food for thoughts. Um, as I ended up on the question panel, so uh, there was a few questions that came in. So once again, I want to reiterate that we will make sure that we answer those uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, bear with me here for one second. I'm not sure how to get rid of the question thing. Uh, bear with me. Uh, okay. So let's talk about assemblies uh, for a minute. So the next uh, 10 minutes or so before we wrap things up, uh, the information we're about to share uh, is part of the uh, the master guideline that we've a uh, series of testing. For those of you not aware, uh, David and Kusatech, we took it upon ourselves a few years back to to test bunch of different assemblies uh, on exposed uh, exposed CLT in this case. Um, and um, from what we've heard anyways, it was super helpful because it was basically data from the same uh, the same CLT structure tested with different assemblies with and without concrete topping uh, in the same exact laboratory with the same exact equipment by the same guy. So to some extent, obviously, it, it gives us a little bit of a, a background to some extent for comparative testing. Uh, so what I'm about to show you are some of the ideas, some of the things that came out of that testing, and uh, we thought it'd be probably a good idea to just share a few things as we uh, as we wrap things up. So in, for your uh, information, what we used in that particular case was a 131 mil uh, CLT. So the reason we chose 131, uh, obviously it's quite uh, you know available out there, and also we would call it. It's called it a worst case scenario kind of deal because it's one of the thinnest um, slab you can see out there. So, you know, it, it could be believed to some extent that anything else we do could be somewhat better. So to some extent, uh, the ratings, just keep in mind that they were testing on a 131. Uh, what was super interesting is to see that when we tested the slab alone, so when I said, you know, 40 minutes ago, I said that you can't associate a rating to a product. Uh, you can technically te test one product or one structure, but we're gonna make sure we know what's on top, what's underneath. In this case, what we need to uh, remember is that when we tested a 131 on its own, so tapping machine on top, receiving machine underneath, it shot an AIIC, if I'm not mistaken, David 23. But things in perspective, and just so we're clear, we have nothing against mass timber. We, we love it. We work on mass timber projects all the time. We think it's a great idea to use wood uh, as a renewal material. That being said, there's reality with concrete, there's reality with wood, there's reality with steel that to some extent we need to take into account. So this whole thing is about making sure we know what animal we're playing with and ultimately to assess the situation accordingly. Put things in perspective, a concrete slab of the same thickness could average shoot 32 IIC. So what that means is because of the density on a slab alone, you're at 23, as example, 21 to 23 versus possibly anywhere between 28 to 36 IIC. So what that means is because of the density, it's slightly on the lower side on the IIC. Good news is there's hope to do a really good job when you compensate uh, that lack of density. Um, and obviously it also applies to the fact that often we're gonna see jobs or projects that are not gonna have a ceiling to some extent, which makes it even more crucial to do a good job with everything that David's talked about and also do a good job with the assembly that's going to be over top of the structure. Examples of some of these assemblies, uh, basically, for example, would be somebody would want to do a polish. We're actually working on one job in Vancouver as we speak. That's that. So you've got your, your, your slab, your mass number slab, extremely important. In this case, it's the Ensonomat from Suprema. Extremely important to achieve minimal ratings, uh, both on IIC and SCC, to decouple the concrete topping from the slab. So if you want a polished finish, you need to understand that these are the kind of ratings you can expect from that, because keep in mind that the slab itself or the polished concrete slab, <clears throat> excuse me, is obviously dense, which means it's going to create more vibration than if you would have another floor over top with a mat of some kind. So uh, ultimately, keep in mind, these are the ratings you could possibly achieve with that. Um, also, keep in mind that in our opinion, well, that's, that's true with both. If you're, for example, doing the, the, the drawing in the bottom, uh, using, in our experience, if you're using three inches of concrete or gypcrete or whatever it may be, 
for acoustics reason. Um, ultimately, from our fan finding, if I'm not mistaken, David, there was no real benefit to use a three inch concrete versus an inch and a half. So if you're doing it for structural or fire reasons, fair enough, but for acoustics, a lot of people thought that more concrete, the better. Well, sometimes there's a limit to that. And then we found that 1.5 inches of concrete, if it is not gonna be a polished um, finished floor, uh, would be would be good enough. So right there, there would be some cost saving uh, and, and, and make sure that we, we know it, whether it's a myth or not. Yeah, uh, so, so Andre, if I may add, yeah. this is only true for, for impact insulation, okay? So uh, regarding airborne noises, the, the heavier the barrier, the best it is. Well, of course, I mean, I'm, absolutely. So if you're in a good place on the STC or you want to get even more on the STC, for sure, the added, adding some mass is going to only help. Uh, one quick note, if you're using a polished topping, uh, usually we want to be over two inches thick on the actual floor to avoid cracking. It has nothing to do with acoustics, everything to do with stability mechanically. Uh, also, obviously, some buildings will require you to have a concrete topping, and it's not necessarily for acoustics reason, it's for fire. So uh, from what we understand, over six stories, you have no choice. To some extent, we're working on a couple of alternatives, but to some extent, as of now, any building we've worked on that's over six stories, you have no choice but to use concrete. But if ever you're, you're on something that's under, under six stories, then sky's the limit uh, to, to even get your one hour fire rating. Um, the assembly on the bottom, that's also something quite typical that we've done uh, in few buildings. Uh, would be basically using some kind of flooring, decoupling the flooring uh, from the concrete topping. And then once again, you're decoupling the concrete topping from the CLT or NLT or glue down, whatever it may be. And then ultimately, you can achieve these kinds of ratings. So one thing to note, extremely crucial to some extent to use the right material. And, and the more time you can decouple, the better, because you already started on the low end on the IIC, which we remember is more problematic than the SCC in some cases. Uh, in both of these cases, because you're adding mass, you're well over the 50 STC required, okay? It goes without saying that I'm going quickly through some of these assemblies. If you guys want to talk one-on-one -on -one after the fact, uh, obviously we'll evaluate and, and consult on that with you. Uh, there's also a, a desire out there, not only with mid-rise, but with mass timber, to some extent, to, you know, how can we save time on, on sequencing, on the schedule? Because labor is expensive. Can we have something to some extent that does not require to have a wet topping, uh, no humidity in the building, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, obviously less weight has become a big deal because if you get rid of the weight, well, then ultimately there's so much more you can do with your building. So we've been working with a lot of people on finding dry topping options when it comes to insulating mass timber. The crazy part about that and the irony about that is there are ways to even do better job acoustically to some extent without using a concrete topping. It's just a matter of using the right principle at the right place and applying uh, the right solutions. Some of these solutions would be the firm itself system. So if you are working, for example, on a commercial application where the uh, 50 does not apply as much as the residential side of things, for example, we have a panel called Fermacell. Fermacell is a three-part system that basically is pre-attached. Obviously, you'll understand the panels are bigger than that, so it's not too time-consuming for labor, but ultimately, they get all puzzled in together, and you can put whatever floor covering you want on top, so saves on labor, on weight, sequencing, and all, and all of that. So this is an example of what you could expect using a firm itself system. If you are considering on a residential side and you need to be over STC 50, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, I know in Europe they've done a lot of that. Ultimately, you can use a firm cell in combination with the honeycomb system. So we've uh, we've also, uh, you know, worked on some jobs or at least been aware of some jobs with this particular system. So again, if you want some information on that, insulation videos, whatever it may be, the Fermacell is recycled content. It's a dry element, uh, you know, fairly, very easy labor-wise to cut. It may as well be uh, installing a, a subfloor made of plywood. So there's nothing complicated about that. It just adds a new subfloor to the mix. Uh, by the way, we're doing currently a bunch of jobs on mid-rise, so like with frame buildings. There's already, there's already buildings on the way with these systems and obviously other areas have already, uh, you know, done it too. So I'm personally out in Western Canada. There's a bunch of those uh, going on with that as we speak. 
Uh, one of the other system that uh, data touched on would be Sawfix. Uh, Sawfix is something that was developed in house. Uh, the points of contacts of Sawfix in a nutshell, basically as obviously more of those balls, two by four feet panel, it literally weighs um, half a pound uh, per panel. So uh, it's extremely, extremely light. And the idea is creating less points of contact between the substrate in this case, mass timber. And basically you basically put two, um, two layers of plywood over top, staggered, crossed from blue. And then ultimately you can end up in a really, really good place acoustically. It all depends on where you wanna be, where the builder wants to be, where the condo owners wanna be. And then ultimately there's some solutions on that front. Again, that allow you to get rid of the wet topping. So that's called Sawfix. Uh, in some cases, and by the way, both the last couple I've showed you, all compatible with all kinds of floor coverings. So if you're doing a rental and it's LVT, whether it's glued down, floated, it's a laminate floor, ceramic tile, even on the ceramic tile, you can't even see that. Um, that was even a shock to us. Normally ceramic tile does not perform as much as a, as a wood or laminate floor, but when we tested ceramic tile with the soft fix, it actually shot even higher than with other floor coverings. So I'm thinking commercial um, commercial jobs, I'm thinking any anywhere where ultimately uh, somebody would like to use tile, then we can achieve ratings are even higher than the building code recommendations of 55. So once again, if you want some information on, uh, on how that works, what it is, what it can do for you, uh, obviously we can customize these assemblies a lot more than what I'm just showing you. One quick thing, by adding a six mil, in this case, it's a lead six, Acoustatech lead six underlay, which is a needle punch technology, may as well be a similar concept than carpet underneath, and then ultimately you can uh, even improve uh, the IIC by a few points. Um, this is just an example, once again, that uh, uh, just a, like the variety. If ever you are uh, very sensitive to acoustics, but you are over, you are over the uh, the sixth uh, story and fire is important. Well, nothing is stopping us from doing a hybrid option, which means obviously you got to plan budget accordingly, you got to plan labor, you got to plan elevation and all of that accordingly. But it does not change the fact that there's really cool things that we can do by combining technology or even combining systems. So this is just a small taste of that. Um, Last but not least, on the product side of things, uh, Suprema has a product called Acoustic Drain. Uh, it's not something that breaks the piggy bank. We, we did the math. Uh, one unit, is, it turns into roughly $75 per unit. One of the most annoying thing in any multifamily, multi-story buildings would be uh, the noise from people flushing the toilet or anything like that. And uh, for a small cost, uh, ultimately, there's, there's easy ways or good ways to actually sound insulate the plumbing uh, side even more than cast iron. So just food for thoughts on that front. Last but not least, it's uh, it's literally we're out of time. I just want to finish by uh, first obviously thanking everyone for attending. If there's any questions, please let us know. How do we work? Acoustic Tech, uh, we're like David pointed out, we work with David, but we work with uh, acoustic engineers locally. Uh, we're able to offer not only recommendations, customize different assemblies. That's what we've been doing from day one. Uh, we're not, um, you know, sold on one system versus another. It's all about what you're looking for. It's all, it all depends on what your needs are. So it's not our decision, it's yours, but we consult with you. We guide you through what your options are and then you can choose uh, for yourself. And then we accompany you through that process. If ever anything becomes a little complex, uh, especially on mass timber. David's there to help. As a matter of fact, as an example, how much we're all coming together. Couple jobs, David collaborated with an, a local acoustic engineer and acoustic tech. So all three kind of got together, gave some recommendations to a local builder. Local bu builder was extremely happy because at the end of the day, he ended up with the system he wanted with the right data to back it up. So it's really important to understand that the services, the on-site testing, the support, uh, documents, so any kind of recommendation, all you've got to do, send us an email, shoot us a text, um, you know, reach out on the website, whatever it may be, and then we'll be more than happy to collaborate with you. And one thing you can't expect from us is the truth. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're not here to 
to make things look better than they really are. We're here to guide you properly and make sure that you're satisfied and anyone involved is actually satisfied. Um, last thing, June 11th is our next webinar on dry topping. So the last few slides on the Sophix, Fermacell, Acoustaboard, which is another system we have for light refrain, we're going to spend an hour only on that. So we're going to be very, very, very precise on what these systems can do on weight, uh, on, on any kind of saving, collateral saving structurally. So that's what we're going to be spending the most time on. Uh, David, you want the last word? No, go ahead, Andre. You're very good. <laughs> Beautiful. So uh, questions, fire them, fire, fire them uh, our way, we'll answer them. And then we'll be super excited to hear from any of you. And then uh, once again, those of you that are in my territory personally, I look forward to being able to cross that once again when everything is uh, clear. Everyone stay safe and uh, enjoy the next, uh, enjoy the weekend coming up. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you very much.